I was having trouble getting out of bed. I was using a walking stick to help me get out of bed. And it took me about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get mobile in the morning. And I would just take a hot shower, get moving. Now I can just hop up out of bed. And it's just the, the stiffness is still there in the neck, the low back. I mean, it's just achy back. I can lift through it. And I felt like, hey, I don't, I don't think I need to be on this biologic. As of this month, it's been one year that I've been off of Humira. I was on financial aid assistance for it. So it would have been six grand a month. Okay. You good? Okay. There we go. There you go. Very, very handsome, man. Eric, good to see you. Nice beard. Hey, uh, where are you located, Aaron? Remind me again where you're at. I, I'm located in uh, Waco, Texas right now. That's right. Okay. Good old Waco. Yeah. And I, I see the nice spine, the, 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 the spine poster behind you. It looks like a skeleton, you know, it's another skeleton, human skeleton in the background. So tell us a little bit about your background. What do you do for a living? And, and we'll get kind of going here, I guess. Okay. So I'm a licensed massage therapist. Um, I'm going on 21 years of experience. And in 2017, I became a massage therapy instructor. So I'm dual license through the state uh, to do massage and teach massage therapy. Became a personal trainer in 2000. And I was kind of wanting to use both modalities with my career and all to do both together and all. But overall, yeah, I was born, uh, I was born in 79. I was raised in the 80s. And I was always taught that fat was bad, red meat was bad. Um, And my mom, you know, I love her. She was an herbalist when I was growing up. And she pretty much uh, was not really big on red meat. And she would send me and my, my brother to school with paper bag lunches. And we were the kids in school that no one wanted to trade lunches with because um, our sandwiches had beet bread. Um, they either had turkey, ham, or, or uh, tuna. And, um, but my dad, he was more animal-based. He worked a side job at the Dallas Tortilla Factory. And he would bring home chicharrones, uh, lengua, which is the cow's tongue. Mm-hmm. And I was like the animal base that I got as a kid growing up. Yeah, I just grew up like that and uh, became a trainer because I saw other gyms, uh, other trainers working with their clients. And I thought, this is something I should get into. And uh, later on down the road, I, I hurt my back and a, a massage therapist helped me with my back pain. And I knew this is something I wanted to do went ahead and pursued that. And you've been in Texas the whole time, pretty much, sounds like, or maybe? Absolutely. My mom also was an herbalist. In Spanish, it's called the Yebaria. She did iridology and um, would check the, if you're not familiar with that, she would check the sperla and the um, iris of the eye and can tell if someone was, had high cholesterol or if they ate a lot of sugar. And me as a kid, I would take my Sunday allowance and buy candy on the weekends <laughs> and my mom would examine me and say that you've been eating candy you've been eating sugar your nerves are showing it so she uh, raised me on vitamins herbs and supplements and uh, later on down the road uh, started having some gut problems my mom would examine me again and say well it looks like your colon needs to be cleansed so she had these smooth move teas these herbal teas that were to detox and of course you know I'd listen to mom and I would take them And later on down the road, um, I started having more upset stomach and having problems. And then around 20, what was it, 2010, I get diagnosed with lymphocytic colitis. And, you know, I was just always eating, again, more herbs, more vitamins. I was taking supplements. I was doing uh, shakes and all that were juicing. So kale, broccoli, spinach. And here I was having all these gut problems. And I was thinking, wow, I'm on the healthiest diet in the world. Why am I still having gut problems? When I went carnivore, um, it it is just a night and day difference. It made a big difference in my, in my health. Yeah. So as a, as a licensed massage therapist, um, you know, what, what I just got, I just want to delve into there for a little while because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, What kind of things are you, I mean, I'm sure there's some science behind some of that. I've seen some of that as far as treatment of conditions, obviously musculoskeletal things. Most people go in there and they're like, yeah, my back hurts and, you know, it feels better when I get a massage. What is, a, what is a, the sort of the state of the science on massage therapy these days, you know? I work with uh, pain populations that are in acute pain. 
Um, we're an outpatient facility where we get car accident, workers comp, um, slip and falls, major meds. And we're just um, doing myofascial release and helping with, uh, you know, some of the, helping them get into a better physical situation, you know, a better situation with that. But um, as far as the, the massage, yeah, I work at a spa as well. And over there, it's more just those that need it because they want to help with their wellness. Some are just coming in just to, because they know they need a massage. They're stressed out. Yeah, I used to, there was a, there was a few years, many years ago, I used to get a massage kind of once a week. You know, I'd splurge on that and I haven't, I haven't had one in God years now. It's been, so it's kind of like, you know, they're kind of nice because you get kind of relaxed and stuff like that. But, um, I know that some people, uh, do benefit from them certainly. And so it's been a, you know, a, you know, a lot of people certainly depending on what their condition is. So let's, let's go back to the, you said you had, you had lymphocytic colitis, uh, how did that, how did that present itself? I mean, obviously most, I mean, I guess we can kind of imagine what colitis must be like, but what, how did, how did it present itself for you? I was more like just upset stomach, uh, the urgency to get up and go to the restroom. First thing when I wake up, um, it was, it was a runny stool and I was just, uh, cramping, bloating, some nausea. And when I got diagnosed by the GI doctor, he did an endoscopy and a colonoscopy. They put me under for that procedure. And as I was there, they, they found a ring in my esophagus, Stotsky's ring. Mm -hmm. And they stuck a, a balloon down there with a claw and expanded it and basically popped the ring. They were saying there's a chance it could come back. And I think over time it, it did. The colitis too is just, um, I was on Acetel which is a, a med that, yeah, I was told that I was going to have to take for the rest of my life. And I haven't, had, I haven't been taking it. So <laughs> it's been years. Yeah. I mean, when you, you know, when you have these, uh, you know, constrictors that develop where they're in different, you know, tubes within our body, I mean, putting, you know, dilators in there can be quite an issue, you know, and, keep, and sometimes they reform for sure. So you said you switched over to a carnivore diet. How did you why did you think about doing that? How did, how did you, cause this is still, even in 2023, a lot of people think it's, uh, you know, not, not a lot of people know about it yet. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly getting more and more well-known, but, but still it's the minority of people that think about this. How did you get into this? My lovely wife. <laughs> so in 2019, uh, we were all doing keto and, you know, with the colitis I had going on, I was still suffering because of the nut flowers you know, the digestive inhibitors that are in almonds and stuff like that were still bothersome uh, via the gut microbiome. Around 2020, my wife tells me that uh, we're living in Mejia at this point. And she tells me that me and my son should both do carnivore. And I thought, really? I, I don't know about that. I, I don't know if I want to go all animal based. I don't think that's sustainable. And um, I saw your podcast with uh, Joe Rogan and uh, listened to it. And, hear what he had to say and what you had to say, his questions and his questions made sense. And I was like, wow. He's, and yeah, you answered him on point. And I thought, wow, this is really, this is going to be something I'm going to have to commit to. You know, I was pretty much doing organs too. I was doing chicken hearts, chicken livers, gizzards, um, uh, red uh, ribeyes and stuff like that. And those really helped me out. I really didn't know what a real good ribeye was until I want to say until my forties, because my wife, she would cook steaks for me you know, in my twenties and thirties. We've been married since 2001. Um, she would cook a ribeye in an oil or when my mom would cook a steak for me when I was, when she would buy meat, she would buy round eyes, like those paper thin steaks and she would fry them in an oil and she would cook them well done. So I really didn't know what a good steak tasted like until later on down the road when I did become carnivore. Yeah, it's kind of a shame. A lot of people never, never, oh, there's a lot of people in the world have never, ever had a good steak, you know, even, even in places where it's not hard to get steak. You know, there's many Americans that have never had a good steak. Some, you know, some people just can't afford it, which I understand, but there are people that can't afford it. And I, like you, my mom was, well, I, I'm sure your mother was a good cook. My mom wasn't a good cook and I never had a good steak at home. <laughs> it wasn't until sometime later. I don't even remember when I had my first good one. I think I, I remember my first encounter with prime rib when I was working as a, as a, as a dishwasher, cleaning dishes at a, at a hotel when I was a 14 year old kid, somebody cut me off a hunk of prime rib and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven with that stuff. But 
So, you know, so you're why so keto, it's interesting because there's a lot of people that will say, well, carnivore is just a version of keto and it's the same thing. Why not just do keto? Because you can include vegetables and fruits and things like that. What was the difference for you? I mean, did it make a significant difference for you to 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 go full carnivore, I guess? Um, a little bit because I like variety and I was so used to having, you know, the the carbohydrate, the rice, the carbohydrates, the, the bread and the meat and the vegetable. Because, you know, as a personal trainer, I was telling my clients, you, you need these three things in your diet. And I was just thinking, wow, like for me to go completely animal based, I knew I had to have a variety of the meats. So I would do ground beef with scrambled eggs and bacon. And sometimes I would do swordfish with a, a steak or tuna with a steak, you know, a, um, yeah, or wild caught salmon with shrimp and a steak. And, and that's kind of like how I did it. I also was hooked on an avocado for a while. Wow. So me and the avocado go way back. I want to say when I was keto vor, I was, I was doing an avocado with almost every meal. So how was that different from your ketogenic diet? The ketogenic diet was what a bunch of almond flour and keto treats. And I mean, what was the difference? My in-laws and my wife, they, they like, they came from having sweet tooths. So they were baking and using, making cheesecakes that had xylitol, erythritol, stevia, and all those sweeteners. Yeah. I think for them, it was just like, I would eat what they would eat because, you know, it's what was for dinner. And of course, you know, that craving would hit me, but I've eradicated my sugar cravings. And yeah, I feel like I don't even, I know I don't need sugar anymore, but if I do want something sweet, then it'll probably be a stevia or a xylitol, erythritol, or one of those um, keto compliant sweeteners, they call them. Yeah, that's, and so, and so what happened with your lymphocytic uh, colitis? Is it, is, it, is it gone now? Has it been? Well, I would say I would have some ups and downs if I do eat a lot of stevia or I consume that. It will give me an upset stomach. But I love where I'm at now because I'd rather be where I'm at now than where I was in 2010 and 2017 where, where literally I would just have problems with my gut. You didn't notice either, but also 2016, another diagnosis came up, ankylosing spondylitis. Doc did x-rays on my neck and said, you evidently had a car accident and you did not get treatment for it. So there's, you know, a Wolf's Law, the body will start to lay down bone, calcified bone growth whenever there's an injury. So it, it made me think of that. And um, he says, go get, get blood labs, get tested for the HLAB27 gene. And then I did. Turns out I had the gene. And then another rheumatologist tells me that 80% of the population will have the gene. It doesn't mean they'll get the disease. So I'm like, well, doc, look at my neck. You know, I'm, I'm having rain stiff, stiffness in my neck. And he goes, well, that could be something else. For ankylosing spondylitis, they're, they were saying it starts in the low back and the SI joints, goes up, fuses through the spine. But um, for me, I was thinking, why is my neck starting to get really stiff? The doctor would try adjusting me. Of course, it was impossible. He'd say, Aaron, I'll, I'll adjust you, but it's going to hurt like hell. <laughs> and I thought, no, let's, 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 let's just do stretching. <laughs> so the diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis was unclear then? Is that the thought? I saw four expert rheumatologists, and they, they were keeping me on a biologic I started taking Humira in 2017 and 2018 of November, um, started weight gaining uh, because of the med and it was inflammation. I had high CRP at the beginning before, you know, all this was happening. And now my CRP numbers are way down. Like I think I was at a 19.0 and then now I'm like a negative two. Ne negative two? Mm -hmm. CRP? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that it goes negative, but, but anyway, maybe, maybe 0 0.2 or something like that. But um, okay. so regardless, it's been, res it's been uh, reduced significantly. Um, how about your symptoms, neck pain, all that stuff that you're having? Is that, is that improved? Well, from the biologic, when I started uh, taking that, I was having trouble getting out of bed. I was using a walking stick to help me get out of bed. And it took me about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get mobile in the morning. And I would just take a hot shower, get moving. Now I can just hop up out of bed. And it's just the, the stiffness is still there in the neck, the low back. I mean, it's just achy back. I can lift through it. And I felt like, hey, I don't, I don't think I need to be on this biologic anymore. So, so are you off the biologic now? You're off the Humira? 
as of as of this month, it's been one year that I've been off of Humira. You've been off of it, and that and how much was that costing you? I, I, do you if you don't mind sharing, or, or was it all insurance based, or what was the deal on that? Actually, I was I was on financial aid assistance for it. So um, I think a, for one injection was a citrate free pen. It was forty milligrams. Uh, was six grand a shot. Six thousand or three grand a shot. Yeah, three thousand. I think it was three thousand, three three grand a shot because I needed two a month, so it would have been six grand a month. Six thousand dollars a month, so that'd be seventy two thousand dollars a year. And so, not needing yeah. that more is 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 you know really really cool. I think that's a, that's pretty exciting there, and your symptoms are better. You don't need a walker to get around and get out of bed or anything like that. It looks like you're functioning pretty well now. Yeah. So obviously, you've had this colitis that has improved. When they diagnosed lymphocytic colitis, how did they make that that specific diagnosis? Was there a colonoscopy? Was there a blood work? Or how did they how did they say this is lymphocytic colitis as opposed to the various other types of colitis that are out there? Right. So uh, they did a uh, endos- colonoscopy and endoscopy mm-hmm. in 2010. Okay. And um, I have the the report, and it just says lymphocytic colitis. Mm-hmm. There some internal hemorrhoids, mm-hmm. and then. Yeah, the the ring that they found in the esophagus. Shotsky ring, okay. And and then so has, it, has that ever been followed up? Did you have a follow up colonoscopy or anything like that? Or, or no? no, I probably should. But yeah. see if it's gone. I, see if I it's figured, really I figured gone. at this point, I, there's no really no point in that. But right. this, you know, right. ten no, years, I, yeah, I, all these years later. I get it. If you're asymptomatic, you know, then what, what's what's the point of having a procedure that might have a risk associated with it? So I get that. So nonetheless, symptoms have gone. Your C-reactive protein dramatically dropped. Your spine and neck pain has improved. Your function is better. Can you, what, I mean, those, so those are the illnesses you were dealing with, at least those two, maybe you have others, but what other things have you noticed since going predominantly meat-based or carnivores or any other, any things with mental health, mood, body composition, skin, anything, anything you've noticed? Um, my dental has improved. I'll, I'll probably get a cleaning like once a year and you know, they, they look at my mouth and they go, wow, you, you have no cavities. You don't eat sugar. You don't eat carbohydrates. You're, you're, you're not drinking sodas. You're not drinking wine or, or coffee anymore. Yeah. And my, my dental health is my toenails were kind of getting kind of, kind of yellow. And, um, those have cleared up. I used to have athletes feel it real bad. Even when I was a teenager walking in gyms, I would really have bad breakouts. And I was talking to my PC, my regular doctor. She goes, yeah, when you're walking around in gyms, uh, you need to find out what bacteria is causing the, the issue. And, I, and it just made me wonder, like, I just want to stop taking Lamisil or, or putting stuff on my feet. I don't want to, I want to stop putting all these creams on my feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, since I've been animal-based, my, my feet are doing better. My sense of smell has improved a lot. Like, my, my family's still ketovore, and they'll eat steaks <laughs> with garlic. They'll chop fresh garlic and put it in a butter sauce. And then, like forty-eight hours later, I can still smell it on their breath. <laughs> yes, you can. Weird, see, but you heightened but, sense um, of smell. I, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess with with some of like the athletes fit foot, you know, the tinnipedis and some of it's usually a fungal infection that's, that's leading to that. But it's interesting, and, I, and I've heard a number of people now that have said things like that: toenail fungus, athlete's foot, tinea corpora, you know, tinea versicolor. All those things seem to have gotten better on carnivore for various reasons. I think maybe you're. I mean, it's probably that our immune system just gets you know, better able to function. And maybe we're not being colonized by these things that, you know, I don't know if the, the, the high carbohydrate diet, you know, is, is reflected in our skin to some degree. It probably is. And then they, they prefer to feast on that thing, you know, on the, on those things perhaps. And so, uh, that's what could be going on. So very interesting. How has, so you said your family has keto, is your wife, was she like, well, you said she introduced you to carnivore. So she obviously supports it, I suppose. Absolutely. When she, when she did, she told me that carnivore would be the best thing for the ankylosing spondylitis mm-hmm. and for the lymphocytic colitis. Yeah. And I thought, well, and, and, you know, even though I would, I was carnivore and then I'd have a cheat, she would just stress the importance to me. You really need to let your gut heal. You, you need to do, you need to let the animal fats and those help your GI health. Yeah. I uh, had a baby back in, um, well, she's, she's 17 months now. And we have full intentions. We're, we're doing fatty meat keto with her. Mm-hmm. She loves steaks. She loves shrimp. She loves salmon. And, but every now and then we'll introduce her to um, some broccoli, you know, she'll 
nibble on it. She'll eat some of it, but um, yeah, she loves strawberries and those would probably be her favorite fruit, but she's, she's a keto war baby for sure. Yeah. And babies have a really high energy demand. And so you give them some fatty food, they're going to, they're going to no doubt like it because it's got, you know, they're, 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 they're just in a really high, high growth phase, particularly in their brain, which is, as hopefully most of us know now is primarily composed of fat. So that, that makes sense to, you know, make sure they get that. And usually, usually, like I said, the, the, the parents that I've seen that have raised their babies on, you know, meat heavy diets have had some really just tremendous success with the babies being pretty, pretty easy going. And, you know, it's just like, you know, you think about it when, when we're hungry or hangry and we're eating a carb based diet, you know, we just, you know, we're, when we're, when we're upset. We just kind of, you know, we let it know and we can kind of grumble around a little bit. A baby, the only way the baby has it let you know they're not feeling good as they scream, right? So you get these people like, why is my baby so fussy? Well, maybe because they're, you know, constantly on this hunger roller coaster, perhaps. Do you find any, uh, you know, like I said, sounds like, I mean, was it hard for you to work back when you were like barely getting out of bed and walking around with a cane? I mean, how are you, I mean, how, do, how does it change your, your job performance? Yeah, it was, it was getting pretty rough. Um, my employers are great. They um, sent me through the x-ray technician program that we had and uh, we had um, contacts with them. My own, the owner was basically saying, if I'm doing more x-ray, then that, that, that would probably take me out of massage for a little bit. This was, this was 2017, 2018 when I really got symptomatic with the AS or during that inflammatory phase. I was doing less massage then. Yeah. And I was, I was just stretching more. The uh, rheumatologist um, instructed me to get into some aquatic therapy and start doing some aquatic exercises. So, um, and I, I love to swim. I've been swimming since I was seven. So um, in school, high school, actually in um, community college, I did intermediate swimming back then. So I thought, well, I know the pool well. And they also helped me become certified in aquatic exercise. So there's this company in Florida that would come down and they would have uh, aquatic therapy conferences at Baylor in Dallas. And it'd be on a weekend where we would do two hours in the pool, two hours uh, in a conference room. We'd break two hours in the pool, two hours in the conference room. That was an eight hour day. And uh, we would do that for a Saturday and Sunday, a couple of times, like in the fall. And I was learning like, okay, with this pain I have, I think if I'm moving a patient in the water, if I'm stretching them in the water, um, like watt suit therapy or doing um, aqua stretch or what's in that? Baruga is the German uh, water therapy, the ring, the Baruga ring method. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm putting floats on these patients. They're floating in the water. They're buoyant. So I can move them and, and that'd be easier on my back. That'd be easier on my neck. But there was, there was times where I was still toughing it out. I was still working a weekend job at spas doing massage therapy there. Um, full day on a weekend. And then I would do my eight hours, you know, like I would Monday through Friday. Did you notice any difference in, in sort of mental health, cognition, mood since shifting diet? Was there, was there, I mean, I mean, it's, I can see where you might be feeling depressed with colitis and AS and things like that, you know, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, any of those things changed for you? Yeah. You reminded me I was, I was having chest pain in 2015 yeah. and I go to an ER and of course, you know, they check me out, heart's doing fine. And I think they were relating it more towards costochonditis, which is comes with inflammatory um, AS and conditions. And the doc, the ER doctor was telling me, you know, you sound like you're an anxious person. You sound like you're having like anxiety right now as we're talking. Do you want a shot? And they gave me a shot of Toradol to, to help with the inflammation. And then they gave me like a, a fourth of a Xanax to kind of calm me down. Then I was having more anxiety. I was having more mood, um, some depressive thoughts, feeling blue mostly back then. And, and that, that has improved, I guess, I assume. Sounds like it. Oh. Sounds like you're pretty happy. Now. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. The only thing that gives me anxiety now is if, if I ever have caffeine. And I, of course, you know, I've been, I'm a caffeine consumer for two decades, but when I became carnivore, I was off of it for about six months. Then the winter months came and then I was wanting something hot to drink. So I would start drinking coffee again. My wife would say, you need, you need bone broth. <laughs> so I was doing, I was kind of going back and forth. And then 
got off of it again for another six months and then I got back on it. So it was just like a back and forth with caffeine. Sounds but like, if, if I had, yeah, I was going to say, sounds like your wife is the enforcer. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. She is. How is she doing, by the way? I mean, did she adopt like an animal based diet or a carnivore diet or what, 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 what's her deal? Oh, absolutely. So um, I want to say in 2017, and I'll, I'll summarize it. She um, saw a functional medicine doctor who had her do blood labs on both of us. That's when I found out I was low in vitamin D. Go figure, right? I'm in dark rooms all day doing massage and never getting outside. But this doctor says, I think I know what's wrong with you. You have Hashimoto's. Uh, you have thyroid condition. You have she, her, her A1C was getting to the diabetic range. She was just feeling horrible all the time. And when she did keto, it, it just, it just made a big difference. Um, she tried out doing some medication. She was doing thyroid medication that was just giving her all these side effects, uh, high flashes and, or she was getting body sweats and, and she was telling this doctor, look, I, I can't take this med anymore. And they wanted to give her more meds to help with the symptoms of that med. And she, she didn't want to do it anymore. And again, when we started doing keto, she lost all this weight, her body, we actually didn't think she could get pregnant and her body went back into reproductive mode. And, um, yeah, we have our, our miracle baby now, but yeah, she's, she's doing good. She's still doing pretty much keto vor. I want to say at this point, she doesn't need anything that she should. And if she does, she'll have, you know, some, she can tell when she's sums off, she, she eats something that she shouldn't. Yeah. Okay. Well, fair enough. So it sounds like the family is thriving along or has gotten a lot better since you changed your diet, which I don't think surprises anybody. Let me go back to just another massage question. So if some, are there certain type, cause there's all these different, you know, you hear, you know, I go on a massage and I've got a menu. This is Swedish massage versus I, there's like, you know, a bunch of different varieties. Do each of them have a different utility for different treatments? I mean, if somebody comes in with a certain condition, would one type of massage work better than another? Is, is, that, is that been your experience? And, and if, if so, can you explain that? Yeah, I want to say like in the medical setting, you know, we do more, well, what we do here is more myofascial release, uh, manual therapy. It's not the effleurage and petrissage like you would get from a Swedish massage. We we work our high knees off. <laughs> so, so yeah, the the healthcare provider, like the work comp adjusters and the attorneys, they, they won't purchase the, yeah, the regular massage associate. If someone calls a spa and says, Hey, I'm having problems with my neck and back. They, they think of a pain person, I, I guess, and they think of that massage therapist and put them up with that massage therapist. Or if someone calls and says, I just want to relax, and they know I have someone that has a softer touch, they, they may put, her, put them with that. From my experience working with some spas, they'll do that. Two Saturdays a month, I work at a, a wellness center in Hewitt. And over there, they have foot detoxing. They have a dome that does infrared therapy. They uh, have massage therapists. They do posture assessments. So we kind of have more wellness. What we what we like to do is more wellness there too. So I feel like I got a good niche with that. I like the spas too, but it's limited over there. Um, some of them will do the add-ons like hot stones, or if they do a deep muscle therapy using the like the biofreeze and the prosage, the pain relieving creams, and then aromatherapies, you know, it, I like to do Graston, Gua Sha with the metal scraping tools. I like to do cupping and over there, it's like, Hey, you can't do that here. Yeah. I was going to ask you about the cupping. Cause that's a rel that's kind of a relatively new, at least I started seeing that about five years ago, people doing that more for more for the people that aren't familiar. Can you explain what cupping is? I mean, seems like you just stick a suction cup to somebody's back more or less or something like that. Isn't that how it works? Definitely. So it, it's another form of, you know, just using the tools, the cups can create a negative pressure with the suction of the cup and how we used it in physical therapy is like if someone had a lower extremity problem, we'd have them walk around the room with the cup on their leg to pull and stretch the tissue with each step they take. There's physical therapy and water cupping where they go underwater and they use a cup, get water inside the cup while it's underwater, submerge it, put it on the extremity, and then they move the ankle into, you know, dorsiflexion and, and yeah, just getting the motion in the ankle. So cupping can be used in a lot of ways. There's stationary cupping where they put the cups on in place and the person can just lay there passively. You know, usually they leave them on for at least two to three minutes. Some people have gone longer than 10 to 15 minutes, but 
The only side effect is, you know, those red circles that are left on the body and all. So, um, yeah, those aren't, I've been, those go away after a few hours, I think. Right. They're not. Pretty. Yeah. Um, do you get much opportunity? I mean, I, you know, like I know some people go to the massage and they like, just let me sleep, you know, don't chat with me. Don't talk to me. Do you ever talk to any of your clients? Do you ever talk to them about diet? Is that something that was, was is, are you allowed to do things like that? Or what's, what's the situation around that? Well, in a, in a relaxation, relaxation setting, I try not to communicate with them, but if they talk, then I'll talk. And in some cases, like, you know, in, in the medical areas too, um, the question will come up, Hey, what'd you have for breakfast? <laughs> and that's where it starts right there is because they'll, they'll just say like, wow, you just had that for breakfast. Uh, aren't you worried about your cholesterol? Aren't you worried about your, yeah, your blood pressure. I mean, it's from eating salt. Are you going to, aren't you worried about getting swelling and getting hypertension and like my blood pressure is fine. I, I do really well. So it'll, it'll come up with some clients and patients, but it doesn't come up, you know, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine it's, it's kind of a tougher situation there. What about your, are you a massage? I mean, do you get your own massages? I mean, it's something you do regularly or what's, I mean, I, you know, I imagine, I mean, I guess you have access. Maybe you got, maybe somebody said, Hey dude, give me a massage or something like that. How does that work? Yeah. So, um, I have a, a friend in Dallas. Her name is Emily. I've known her since 2011. She's been, a, we've worked at a massage envy together and yeah, she's like one of my go-to that I trade out with, you know, we either do an hour and then, yeah, we would just trade out one day that we can relax, that I can relax. And then we'll schedule another day where she can relax. So we're not just doing them both at the same time, you know, and, and working and then having to relax. So, so yeah, we just try to find an off day to do that. Um, I actually have a gift card for a massage right now and I need to use it, but it's um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to find other massage therapists that do trade out or if, if I just want to pay for it and do it myself, I will. And um, yeah, just go from there or self-care too. You know, I'll, I'll cup myself. Um, I'll swim at the gym and then take some of the silicone cups, get in the hot tub after my swim, get in the steam room, another 10 minutes, get real warmed up, cormetic effect. And I'll just put those cups on and just kind of just stretch my neck around my traps and, and, and get a good, good therapy session. Good me time. <laughs> there's a, uh, in recent years, there's been a, a, uh, you know, a lot of people have, uh, utilized and have access to these massage guns. You know, they're kind of like vibration guns oh, yeah. that percussive drum, per percussive, you know, massage, any thoughts on the, the effectiveness or the utility of that? Or is that, is that a net positive, net negative? What are your thoughts? I do have one of those. Um, it's a Theragun G3 Pro. I've had it since 2019. And, you know, I'll use it on myself. I'll use it on a client. But I'd probably use it for like maybe eight to ten minutes and then go over with, you know, just manual elbow, forearm, knuckle, just really work those muscles. But, yeah, I use it as a little bit of a tool. Um, but I don't let it replace the massage, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it has a utility there. You don't think it's harmful in any way? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, on, on a patient that's symptomatic that just had a car accident, they're going to be stiff and, and moving in the facility. So something that turbulent might, might not get them to relax their muscles a little bit. So I'll do a, a myofascial release approach. Um, just, yeah, just by stretching them lightly. Uh, some athletes too, will use it, you know, between recovery. Um, they'll, let's say if they do a set, get a minute on the gun and then go back on the next set. You know, we, we've used it like that too for active recovery. Do you find some people are harder than, or than others to massage? I know, I know when I go in and like, they look at me and like, damn, I should charge you by the pound or something like that. I'm just, you know, I'm a pretty big guy, a decent amount of muscle on me. And, um, do you find that some people are easier to massage? I mean, I guess maybe a smaller person be easier to massage. It makes sense to me, but is that what you find? Um, I think a, l a little bit is of it's like that, but then again, at, in massage school, they taught us how to, um, use proper body mechanics, um, how to lower the table real low. Um, also do a form of Thai yoga massage where it doesn't even incorporate uh, a, a table. It, it incorporates a mat where I can use my knee or my elbow or my body weight and just lean into, you know, the, the stretch or their, their body too, to get more, more pressure. But, um, but yeah, then, then again, I've done some deep massages where it was like I was MMA wrestling with somebody. 
Yeah, I mean, some, just like, well, it's just, you know, I, you know, I can say like when I would operate on people and they were really, really big, it's harder because you got you're literally wrestling with them, particularly when they're under anesthesia and they're, they're literally, literally dead weight and you're trying to move a 350 pound person around. It's it's a task for sure. So, I mean, obviously you get somebody that's kind of cooperative, but if they kind of go to, you know, how often do you get people fall asleep on you? Does that happen fairly frequently? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start out and I'll, I'll hear them just, I'll tell them take a deep breath and I'll hear the regular breath and then I'll hear the breathing shift to snoring. And then, um, you know, it, I mean, it, it sometimes happens within the what, first 10 minutes or so, or they're tired and they say, Hey, I've been didn't sleep all last night. If I fall asleep on you, I apologize. Like, no, you're fine. Go ahead. And then, you know, I've had that. Do you find, I mean, some people talk about having, you know, knots, you know, whether it's fascial knots or, you know, it's, you know, muscle that's tense or something like that. Do you, do you find much of that? And do you think there's a correlation with nutrition in that? I mean, I don't know if you, I'm sure you don't get an idea of what everybody's eating when you're, when you're massaging, but do you, do you see any difference in those types of things? Well, I mean, now you make me uh, wonder about that. Um, but, um, I kind of think back with, um, and this is some history, but JFK, um, I believe he had a therapist by the name of Janet Travell. And she worked with uh, JFK with trigger points. And yeah, the Travel method came out, after, I think, after that. But we have these charts in the room that show the anatomy of the muscle. And they're marked with little X's that show the common areas of where these sore spots are. And we call those trigger points. And um, they're on, all over the body. You know, they're, they're in the extremities. They're in the spine, the low back. And these are hyper irritable spots in the muscle that can cause localized pain or referred pain going to another muscle. So um, the goal is to that is to help get that muscle to calm down. Plus we do a cross fiber friction on that, like circular motions to milk that muscle to increase the blood flow. Cause when there's a tightness there, it prevents the proper blood flow. So the muscles don't get the nutrients they need. And um, after a few treatments of that, and it doesn't happen right away. Sometimes it takes time. But yeah, that, that person's like, you know, hey, how's this pain here? And they're like, you know, it doesn't bother me anymore. I mean, it's it's gotten better. But with, with diet and all, yeah, I really, I, I am curious about that. I do want to know more about, yeah, diet and that'll help with yeah, uh, having knots for sure. Do you, uh, since you've been on an animal-based diet, a ketovore, carnivore diet, um, have you had any negative, negatively directed your way? Is anybody saying, you know, this is bad and you're, you're a bad person because you eat meat or any, any of that stuff? I've, I've probably gotten some pushback from my parents. Um, my, my dad is, um, he's in his six, he's in his seventies and he was just telling me, you know, Mijo, you need to, you need to add some lettuce in your diet. You need to put some, something green in there. You just can't really do, shouldn't be doing meat. And I'm like, really? You're, you're the one that raised me on eating animal based. But uh, he's, uh, yeah. But really, I would just say from my dad, I had some other coaches that I've known that are, that are not Rivero coaches. They're another coach and they've told me, yeah, it's not, it's not sustainable. Or um, yeah, you, you got to get some plant based in you. And, and, and then some say, Hey, it's concepts, you know, you have this in your head, you know, if you, if you think eating meat's healthier for you, it's going to be better for you. And I'm, and I'm thinking, no, this is something happens at the, at the cellular level. I mean, in our gut microbiome, our body breaks down things and we, our body breaks stuff down in a certain way. It has to be, that's the science. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this this belief that we must, if we don't have vegetables, we're going to die or something bad is going to happen to us. And like, why? I mean, you know, most of the, it's interesting. Most of the vegetables that humans consume today, we literally invented those things. You know, it's like they, they didn't really grow wild that what most of what we see in the grocery store has been all hybridized and cultivated and invented. So it's kind of like, well, why would we need it if we had to invent it? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting type of type of situation. Well, we are uh, just about out of time. Do you have a social media? Are you on social media much? Yeah, I do. I have I have a couple. Um, my uh, massage therapist Instagram mm -hmm. is Aaron underscore massage underscore therapist, and then my carnivore <laughs> Instagram is my last name, which is B A R B O Z A Barboza mm -hmm. dot Aaron. Barboza and it's my, dot Aaron. It's just, 
Carnival. Yeah, Barboza.Aaron. All right. And if somebody is in the Waco area, they could hook up with a massage for you. Is that right? Or they just have to look you up? Or is there a way to get in there to get that done? Yeah, there's um, there's a way through um, through Pivotal where I work there. They they can get on the Pivotal Pathway Wellness Center. Uh, I think it's um, – oh, I don't have that website, but, um, but it's – yeah, it's in Hewitt, and um, they can schedule with me online, or they can call the spa, and, and um, they'll or call the wellness center, and they'll schedule them there. Yeah, you want—I mean, you want you you want you don't want a vegan massage, and you because they're going to be too weak to get a decent job, and you want something strong carnivore in there. So that's what I would do. All right, Aaron, thanks for thanks for doing this, man. Appreciate it. The rest of you guys, we'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for everybody. Uh, we'll see you guys later. Take care, and bye bye now. All right, thank you, Sean. Hey folks, it's Dr. Sean Baker here. If you guys are enjoying these success stories, well, you can become your own success story. You can do that by heading over to carnivore.diet. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and get started today. We're looking forward to supporting you. Our community is wonderful, and we'd love to see your success.